I might have played the part of Giles in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but I don't know everything about the supernatural world. Still, you can't hang around this occult thing without getting a little curious. Where do all these supernatural tales come from? I'm about to begin a journey into the belly of a beast that has no body. In this film, I'm going to Hellenbach to find the truth behind demons. Demons have been with us forever. Every culture since the beginning of time has feared these disembodied evil spirits that vex the world. But today, we're beyond all that. Surely. A couple of years ago, I saw a TV show about exorcism still happening in Italy. What you're about to see is unique. It's a verified recording, not a reconstruction. Sit back and watch a demon possessing a human being. Nel nome del Padre, del Figlio e dello Spirito Santo. Signore Gesù Cristo, Figlio di Perù Eterno Padre, Dio Universo. According to her parents, 16-year-old Martina has suffered from possession for 10 years. No one could help her but the exorcist. Aspetta, Maria, è di Cristo! È di Cristo! È di Cristo! Ecco, ecco, ecco l'acqua del Signore, del Signore, del Signore, del Signore, del Signore, Il demone esiste o non esiste? Come, esiste il demonio! Come, come fa a dimostrarlo? Come fa a dimostrarlo non che esiste? Vale le guerre, tutto, tutto! Ma questo... Io esisto! E chi ma, non ci crede bene Ma questo... How do you begin to make sense of that? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to start my search for demons by plunging right into the heart of the Catholic Church. The Vatican. If you think demonic possession has fallen between the cushions of history, think again. The Catholic Church has been carrying out thousands of exorcisms each year for over 500 years. Each one a battle for the body and soul of a person infested by demons. In 1999, the present Pope renewed the rite of exorcism and greatly increased his army of exorcists. Does he know something we don't? I'm going to meet Father Gabriele Amort. He's the honorary president of the International Association of Exorcists. It's a great title. He's pretty much the most experienced exorcist in the Roman Catholic Church in the world. If anybody on earth knows about battling evil and demons, it's him. What is an exorcism? Un esorcismo è semplicemente una preghiera. An exorcism is simply a prayer using the name of Jesus to expel Satan, destroying evil in somebody who is possessed. How does a, a, a demon make itself known? During the exorcism, if a demon is present, a person can go into a trance, then become furious. There is a dialogue with the devil. I speak to the devil. So, demons are real? They are real. They are much more intelligent beings than us, precisely because they are pure spirits. Are there any physical manifestations? Yes. The possessed sometimes expel objects. At the moment, I have somebody who I'm curing through exorcism who expels nails. Wow. The nails materialize the moment that they leave his mouth, so they don't harm his internal organs in any way. Do you find yourself recognizing the same demons, like you're encountering an old enemy? time after time. There are so many. The biblical names of the strongest demons are Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer, Belilal, Lilith, 
Viridian, etc. I have met them many times, many times. I've heard what the representatives of heaven have to say. So let's check out the opposition. I'm going somewhere intensely hot. I'm going to hell. My quest to find demons leads me here, to the Syrian desert. Though sun-blasted now, it once held great cities and religions, people whose gods would become our demons. Here, in the cradle of civilization, are the dark roots of demonism. I've come to see one of the few temples ever built to honor the devil. Seriously, very cool. The site is 5,000 years old, and someone who knows about its history is waiting to meet me down there. Renowned authority and Oxford professor of biblical studies, John Day, know some of the greatest demons. There's Mastema, Belial, but uh, one could perhaps also mention Beelzebul, which later got corrupted to Beelzebub. Ah, Beelzebub is one that you hear quite often, and certainly the most demonic sounding one. Where does that one come from? That's a really fascinating question, you know. Zabul Baal was a title of the god Baal, about 1300 BC. It meant Prince Baal. The way John tells it, Baal's ghost still haunts these ruins. A fertility god, worshipped for 2,000 years in the Near East, Baal brought the rains to the land in the winter. But during the scorching heat of summer, Baal went down to the underworld. Maybe that's where we get our ideas of hell. Some scholars have even conjectured there might have been some sexual rituals involved with the cult of Baal, but that is actually uh -huh. heavily, heavily debated at the present time. And and, and many scholars think this is all a lot of baloney, actually. Um, I think, personally, there might be something. Well, yeah, I mean, if, I mean it, it follows that if he was a god of fertility, that usually um, there was some, some sexual excitement involved, I would have thought. A fertility god? Possible sexual rituals. Baal may have been a bit of a lad, but how did he become the evil demon Beelzebub? Originally Baal was a very exalted title, uh, but eventually it got cut down to being the name of a demon. One of the leading gods became the name of the leading demon. It seems the Jews, then the Christians, took all of Baal's good qualities for their own god and ascribed all the unpleasant things to Baal. The name got altered in later manuscripts to Beelzebub, which means, funny enough, Lord of the Flies. That's where the phrase Lord of the Flies comes from, believe it or not. Fascinating, isn't it? And uh, so, in a sense, this was a way in which uh, people could say the enemy was dung, you know? <laughs> <laughs> With so many demons to choose from, I think I'll focus on Beelzebub. A little fecundity, some sex, a few flies. On the presumption that demons are real, I asked John if anybody knows what Beelzebub looks like, acts like, smells like. He suggested I talk to Irina Bacchus, the world expert on the infamous miracle of Laon. This apparently is the most famous and best documented case of Beelzebub ever coming to Earth.
Reading about Beelzebub's little visit, it seems he slipped into our world through the fragile body of a French girl named Nicole Aubry. But what the Lord of the Flies would do to that body would rock the Christian world. I've come to Laon to see the eyewitness accounts of Beelzebub's reign of terror. What is this? These are all copies of the official account that was commissioned by the King of France at the time in August 1566, contemporary with the events, or shortly after the events. This is 500 years old. Yes, about, yes. She wasn't terribly attractive. Well, no, not at this point she wouldn't be because she was disfigured by Beelzebub. Yes. Here her back is arched right over. She would arch over backwards, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. So you couldn't see her head. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> Here she's being held down. Every time she was, in fact, superhumanly strong, so that several men had difficulties keeping her down. How old was she? She was 16. She was already married. Her husband and her family were present throughout. I asked Irena to translate the story for me from the medieval French. And what a story it proved to be. The drama you're about to see uses the exact words spoken at the time. On November the 3rd, 1565, Nicole was alone praying at the tomb of her maternal grandfather, Joachim Wio. His spirit entered into her and spoke to her. <laughs> he claimed to be in purgatory, still with certain vows unaccomplished. He asked Nicole to have a pilgrimage made to St. James at Compostela. On the second day of December, about the eighth hour of the evening, some of the family saw that the girl began to behave strangely and was then taken by terrible convulsions. <laughs> Nicole said she had fits because her parents hadn't done the pilgrimage yet. Not wanting to spend the money, her parents had just pretended to go. Nicole was not deceived. Her parents completely freed. According to Arena, clairvoyance is one of the first proofs of demonic possession. I got the alarm bells ringing. It's the first of the six steps in an exorcism. Her parents asked a Dominican monk, Pierre de la Motte, to call forth the spirit. Quand es-tu entré en Nicole? Unable to comprehend what was happening, they took her to her local church and waited for help. January the 4th, 1566, Jean de Bord, the Bishop of Laon, arrived. Mm -hmm determined to get to the bottom of this increasingly strange case. Croyez-moi, je vous dis que je suis son bon ange. Menteur. <laughs> tu n'es pas un bon ange. Qui es-tu, malin esprit Qui es-tu, malin esprit Quel est ton nom the 
fame of her possession spreading, Nicole, or should I say Beelzebub, was paraded through villages until she was brought here, Laon Cathedral, on the 24th of January, 1566. people a day witnessed the spectacle for over two months. The exorcisms always began by using holy water, the sign of the cross, and other holy objects. But far from expelling it, they only seemed to inflame and anger the demon. Accounts claim that a man's voice emerged from Nicole, even when her lips never moved. Hey, Marguerite! Oui, toi, femme de Lancelot de Mai. Ton mari a perdu cette nuit 200 testons d'argent. <laughs> Monsieur de Nel les a gagnés. Ah oui? As Beelzebub, the possessed Nicole was constantly accusing onlookers of secret sins, accurately. And what made this even more surprising was that these were unconfessed sins, unknown to anyone but the sinner, and led to thousands wanting to confess to a priest before their innermost secrets became public at the exorcisms. The battle for Nicole raged on until Bishop de Boer found a decisive weapon, the Holy Eucharist. The wafer the Catholics believe is changed into the body of Christ during Mass. Voici la Sainte Hostie. Regarde-la, Belzébut. Esprit malin. Ennemi mortel de Dieu, je te commande, au nom du précieux corps de notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ, ici présent, de sortir de cette pauvre femme et t'en vas au profond des enfers pour y être tourmenté. Witnesses said that when the demon was confronted with the Holy Eucharist, it was rendered temporarily impotent. A most bizarre phenomena that occurred is that the demon would retire into her left arm, freezing it solid. Elle ne veut pas desserrer ses doigts. Il n'y a que la force du précieux corps de Jésus-Christ qui le fera sortir. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire Il faut continuer. Continuer jusqu'à la fin. D'accord, je m'en réfère. Once she had swallowed the Eucharist, Nicole would become rigid and insensible. The public were invited to handle her and stick pins into her flesh. She seemed to feel nothing. This was extraordinary spectacle. It, it may seem barbaric to us, but to the people of the time, this was living proof that demons exist. And with it came the proof that God exists too. As the weeks wore on, the Bishop de Boer claimed a small victory. Nicole recovered her sight, speech and hearing. <gasps> but not for long. Oh, malin esprit, mortel ennemi de Dieu, regarde le précieux corps. Ôte-moi, bonjour le blanc. Beelzebub came back with a vengeance, 
with 29 friends from hell. The 30 demons repossessed her up to 50 times an hour, desperate to remain in Nikon. <laughs> different demons, different languages. As the Holy Eucharist subdued one, yet another demon would spew out of Nicole's mouth. Du kannst nicht gewinnen. Auch wenn du mich dazu bringst, sie zu verlassen, komme ich zurück, wann immer ich will. It seemed a demon's only alternative to being in a living victim was to suffer in hell. Possession by devils is not just a Catholic phenomenon. Over the ages, scores of cultures and faiths have, have documented the proofs that differentiate between demonic possession and disease. Nicole manifested virtually every proof. Eyewitness accounts of Nicole's exorcism attest to the most spectacular proof of possession. <gasps> Beelzebub was a consummate showman. Are demons real or just imagined? To the crowds in Laon Cathedral, there was no doubt. The laws of nature and God had been defied. The question was, would God really have the final say? The battle in Laon Cathedral went on every day for over two months. Though Nicole ate nothing but hosts and drank only a little communion wine, she lay swollen by the demon. The holy water burned him, draining his demonic strength. But Beelzebub flared up in a titanic rage. He struggled so violently, Nicole's bones were snapped like twigs. Though frightened and exhausted, Bishop de Beau's faith in the power of the Eucharist was his only hope. He never gave up. The final expulsion of Beelzebub came at 3 p.m. on Friday, February the 8th, 1566. The sign of his final defeat was to be found in the recuperation of Nicole's left arm that had been paralyzed since she first became possessed. Witnesses all attested to his departure in a puff of black smoke to the sound of all the demons receding back to hell. Nicole was left physically broken and holding onto a sanity by a thread. But to the Catholic Church, it was a great victory over the power of evil. One cannot help but wonder if the miracle of Laon was all that it seems. Was it all a hoax? Are there really devils? I've travelled from the origins of European demons in the Middle East to the Vatican so far. And I've looked into the spectacular possession of Nicole Aubry in 1565 here in Laon, France. But did the demon Beelzebub really possess Nicole? I want to question historian Irene Bacchus further about the miracle of Laon. How was Nicole described as a, as a little girl? She was described as l'ordre d'esprit, which is, in other words, not very bright. 
She was brought up at a convent in Montreuil. She spent seven years there, apparently. She was obviously someone seeking attention that she perhaps did not get at home. Would you say one sort of person is more vulnerable than another to possession? Yes. The more fragile your identity, the more vulnerable you are to possession. She certainly comes in that category. Tell us a bit about her medical background. Complicated. She was, I think, a slightly disturbed child. She was bitten by a dog, her head was scarred. Secondly, there's the falling down the stairs and head injuries. Finally, there's the curious things that the devil himself reveals, who says that he claimed her for his own when she was 11. From then on starts a curious history of kleptomania, of stealing small objects from her parents. She was also pregnant, of course, and gave birth that would have been September 1566. The pregnancy must have taken place during the exorcism, which would so not... So whose was it? So whose was it? Well, it could have quite simply been her husband. Or it could have been one of the exorcists. And what about the crowd apparently hearing Beelzebub speaking clearly without Nicole's mouth moving? There's a, a part of the text that I wanted to quote. I have an English translation. It says, Ill-willed people hid and injured the feet of those standing above by pushing up spikes between the planks. Could it be that priests trained in the arts of rhetoric and biblical studies were actually providing the voices of Beelzebub and the other demons, and might even have been the ill-willed people that were underneath the planks pushing spikes. It's possible, but the voices started before she was brought into the cathedral. The voices started already in Vermont. It transpires that this was one big publicity-seeking demon. He demanded a stage be built saying it was not right to hide what God wanted manifested and known to all the world. And then he wanted a bigger stage, and he got it. He got it all, including the audience, to match. Some say that there are 150,000 people who witnessed the spectacle. Those recording the events gave Beelzebub a very Catholic dislike of the new Protestant faith, especially the Huguenots. Uh, what was that about? French Protestants, yes. Well, it was about the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, transubstantiation, as it was called, and the only thing that, or person, that Beelzebub would come out for was Jesus Christ himself as present in the host. So the whole show became about proving the power of the host, which is a very Catholic belief. Yes. Gotcha. Mm. Irena points out that holy water, the cross, and the usual religious objects only angered the demon. That way, it was all the more impressive when the power of the host rendered Beelzebub impotent. Stunning and irrefutable evidence of the power of the Eucharist. Le doigt de Dieu est là. Perhaps the true significance of the miracle of Laon 
was that it was a major victory in an ideological war. Irena has an interesting footnote. In 1577, 11 years after Beelzebub's visit, Nicole was possessed once more. She went temporarily blind, but this time the church didn't need her. She'd served her purpose. There were no crowds, no one recording it, no attention. It makes you wonder. So was this all just political theatre? And was Nicola a willing puppet at its centre? If so, who was pulling her strings? Beelzebub or the Catholic Church? I've got a few more questions to ask the Vatican's chief exorcist. Thank you for seeing me again, Father. Just a few more questions. Critics would say that possession can be explained away by psychiatric disorders like multiple personality. What do you say to them? During those exorcisms in which one can determine if a person is possessed or if the person is psychologically ill, strange things can occur. For example, the person speaks languages that he absolutely does not know, that the person knows hidden things that he cannot know, that the person levitates. I once had a farmer who had to be held down by six men. He was so furious, and during the exorcism he levitated roughly this much. Do you refer possibly possessed people to psychiatrists? Yes, I do send people to psychiatrists. In fact, I have a joke in men. When I see that a person is not demonically possessed, I say, you have no devil. If you have problems, go find a good vet. I think it might be time to see a shrink. A man with extraordinary experience of what some call demons. Dr. Sanderson. That's right. Good to see you, Tony. Uh, how are demons and possession viewed by psychiatrists today? With a great deal of scepticism. I don't myself use the term demonic possession. I've never come across a case, if indeed it exists. Um, so I prefer to use the term spirit attachment rather than possession. The spirits which most commonly influence people are human spirits. The spirits of people who've died and yeah. the spirit instead of going on into the light into the spirit world um, has for some reason or other stayed behind. So you speak with spirits? Well I can play you a tape of one of my patients and then uh, you'll have uh, a much better idea of what actually happens. This is a young woman of 33, we'll call her Louise, and she'd been admitted to one of my beds at Fairfield Hospital with a panic attack. Now, panic attacks are common, but I'd, it's the only patient I've ever seen that had such an outsized panic attack that she was admitted to hospital with it. <laughs> and she'd also had terrible headaches and uh, depression and quite a lot of problems. And I treated her using hypnosis, which I commonly do with my patients. Under hypnosis, Louise's subconscious revealed that she did have a spirit attachment, a stubborn middle-aged woman named Gladys. So I said, well, I think I'll have a word with Gladys. <laughs> and uh, can Gladys come forward? And she said, yes. And uh, so I spoke to Gladys. And this is where I think we'll I'll just play the tape and you can hear what, what came over. Now tell me this. How old is Louise when you joined her? When she was born. She at the moment of birth or before? No, when she was born. At the moment of birth. At the moment of birth. I see. 
These are Dr. Sanderson's sound recordings of actual sessions, where the voice of the spirit Gladys spoke through his patient, Louise. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that she's going to need you for much longer? Yes. All her life? Yes. Well, it's really nice to talk to you. It's very nice to know that you are very concerned about her, and I'm sure Louise is happy about that. But I think we also need to consider the effect that you're having on Louise. She doesn't know which feelings are yours and which are hers. And now I can imagine that perhaps you haven't always approved of Louise's friend. Oh, no. No. Not the man. No, well, quite. So you've uh, actually tried to get them out of her life? Oh, Yes. Great. Hmm. When I brought Louise out of hypnosis and uh, she, and I asked her about this uh, Gladys and she said, well, uh, I'm not sure, but I think there may have been uh, a great aunt who died a long time before I was born. Um, she died at the age of 55 of cancer. She'd had uh, a pretty unhappy life with a husband who was alcoholic and uh, behaved badly to her. And the great tragedy in her life was the loss of her son, Roy. Gladys. I was sorry to learn that your life was such a difficult one. You often think of it now. All the time. Do you? And with very deep unhappiness, I think, don't you? Yes. And anger. And anger, yeah. Who is it that you're angry with, Gladys? Your husband? Yes. What was his name? Michael. Michael, yeah. So, so violent, so nasty. Violent to you, was he? Terribly. Oh. And you have, you had two other children, of course, but it was Roy that was really a favourite. Well, name? he was my boy. Mm. How old was he when he died? Twenty-eight. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm. Gladys's anger is the key to the problem and she needs some therapy. Fortunately, therapy with spirits is very much quicker than therapy with uh, embodied people. Why? I can only tell you from experience it just is. <laughs> and it happens uh, in just two or three minutes. I told her that what she needed now, having released that anger, was just to go on and go on into the spirit world. Now think back to the time with Roy. Think how proud you were as a young mother when he was born. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a wonderful time? So proud of yourself. At last, the boy. And he grew up so beautifully and you were so proud of him right through his childhood. And then as a young man, was he very good looking? Mm -hmm. Was he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were in love with him, weren't you? Oh, yes, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And then the accident. And that made you so sad. That's what really broke you, didn't it? Made you so unhappy. But Gladys, do you know something? When you go, when you decide to leave Louise and go into the light, you can be with Roy again and meet him again. Did you realize that? I'm sure that Roy will come and meet you and take you into the night, and that's going to be a wonderful experience for you. So, Gladys, I'd like to suggest that now is the time to leave that anger behind. Just have the experience gently rising up out of your body, leaving behind the anger at your early death, leaving behind the anger with Michael, leaving behind the anger at the loss of Royal. 
just rise up out of your body. How did it feel to be released from it? Yes, wonderful. Good. So now, when you're ready, all you need to do, Gladys, is just to look round and you see Roy. Just look round and see mm. There he is. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful surprise? Oh. How's he looking? He's wonderful. Great. And what's he, how is he, how is he greeting you? He's waving. Mm -hmm. All right, so let him come close. Mm. Take him in your arms. Oh. Isn't that wonderful? Well, that's cool. It was a very moving experience for for Gladys and for uh, me. Yeah, and me. Yeah, it's. Uh, oh, it's truth. So it's quite some years since I listened to that, but it's yeah. it's good to hear it again. Mm. And uh, and once a once a spirit goes into the light like that, they don't come back. Mm. Um, when I first started this work I didn't do it so effectively and one or two did come back but um, if you can be sure that they really go then they go yeah, yeah. and it's always worth checking once you've released spirits and you think it's all finished mm. then you ask again is there anyone there and that's what I did but some spirits are not so benign. It's always worth checking once you've released spirits and you think it's all finished, then you ask again, is there anyone there? And that's what I did. Okay. So I'll play the next little bit. Mm. How does that feel, Louise? She left you now? Yes, she's gone. Okay. I feel quite happy for her. That's just speaking out to your subconscious at a deep level, I think you'll just check and make sure and see whether there's anyone else with it that can help. Subconscious, just please answer through Louise's fingers. Subconscious, is there anybody else with Louise now? Is there anybody hiding, possibly? There is. So there are two people for the reads. something was happening and that was a bit of a, a surprise to me. In all she had four spirits with her and having released them she was really transformed. Yeah. I didn't have to do any more therapy with her and she lost all these symptoms, the headaches, the panic attacks, the depression and she also lost, I don't know what, eight or nine kilos in weight. I'm not quite sure no. what that was related to. In a month or six weeks, quite quickly, quite quickly. Wow. Though Louise declined to be interviewed, she's now completely recovered and living a normal life. 
thing that strikes me most about the, the spirits that Dr. Sanderson exercises in his own very gentle way is their humanity. And Gladys being released from her anger and her joy at joining her son that she loves so much. Perhaps demons are just lost, sometimes angry spirits, not so different from us. They're people just without the body. It seems to me that the demons may already be in us. Nicole Aubrey wasn't so unusual. Anyone could lose themselves to a demon. Perhaps you recognize the voice of the demon. It starts as your own will. To be naughty, selfish, even a bit cruel. It's familiar, and the pleasure of giving in to the voice is real. And the pleasure grows as your aggressive acts grow. And your acts grow as the voice grows. Until one day, it's too late. The voice has you. There is no more pleasure. There is only the voice. You try to fight it, but it's too late. It's too strong. You get smaller and smaller, like you're falling into a black hole. And then you're gone. The demon has your life, your body, your soul. Of course. Everyone knows there's no such things as demons. <laughs>